हेलो एवरीवन आई एम टी वी रूपाक्षानंद एंड वेलकम टू द फिफ्थ सेशन ऑफ जियो वार्ता ऑर्गेनाइजर बनर्स हिंदू यूनिवर्सिटी जियो फिजिकल सोसाइटी दिस इवेंट इज कंप्राइज ऑफ वेरी फाइन एंड ब्रीफ लेक्चर्स ऑफ एमिनेंट पर्सनालिटीज इन द फील्ड ऑफ आर्थ साइंसेज अर्लियर वी हैड लेक्चर्स विद प्रोफेसर एन वी सी राव डॉक्टर सुकांता रॉय डॉक्टर ए के श्रीवास्तवा एंड डॉक्टर खेम राज शुक्ला यू कैन वॉच देयर लेक्चर्स ऑन आर यूट्यूब चैनल विच इज एस सी टी बी एच यू वेल इन कंटिन्यूएशन टूडे वी हैव अनदर वेरी वंडरफुल गेस्ट सौम्य दीप दास सर सर हैज़ एन एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ मोर देन फिफ्टीन ईयर्स विद इंडस्ट्रीज एंड करेंटली ही इज वर्किंग विद स्लम्बर जे ही विल बी गिविंग अस एन ओवर व्यू ऑफ सीस्मिक डेटा प्रोसेसिंग फ्राम बेसिक टू एडवांस लेवल विच विल बी वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव इन कॉन्टेक्स टू एनी यूनिवर्सिटी लेवल कोर्स ऑन जियो फिजिक्स at the end of the lecture there will be a brief question and answer session and for that uh, you are not supposed to switch on your mics uh, just type in your questions in the chat box i will assist sir and uh, he will answer your questions as per his convenience uh yeah there will be a feedback form as well and you are requested to fill it and the feedback form is mandatory for our geo question participants because Uh, from that we will uh, mark your attendance and you will get certificates later uh, also the whole session uh, for your prior information the whole session is on recording uh, so that we can upload it on a, a youtube channel which is uh, scbhu uh, so uh, that our rest of our participants who are not here can join it later uh, yeah so that's uh, the announcement part and now i will request sir to Uh, please start uh, the lecture sir please sure good morning everybody uh, and uh, very good day myself samadeep das and i'll be presenting the processing scenario what is current in the industry so everybody has a get a good grasp of what happens in the industry other than that what is found in the books which we read so my objective will be to bring you in speed with the new stocks that is happening around the globe in different companies different uh, services companies client companies and new algorithms that are used mostly so with with any further ado let's start so it is the seismic processing that i am going to present today will be from basic to advanced so right the agenda will be pretty simple i will put a framework of the processing sequences and and strategies then i will be reviewing all the processing blocks within the framework with examples and then we can have a qa session as much as you want so so for this is the framework of processing sequence and strategies so why do i have sequences and strategies in this particular slide because the processing sequence is designed to address certain criteria for example a particular geologic challenge a particular exploration objective is it in the development phase is is in the exploration phase and all that kind of zeros so the basic is time processing where you will be mostly dealing with taking the data set that you acquire and condition it to be ready for further and immediate processing and image so that's the reason i said processing sequences and strategies i will be breaking my presentation into time imaging which is pretty basic but it contains lot of advanced algorithms which i i will be presenting then the depth imaging which is velocity model bedding and depth migration then advanced depth imaging which is full waveform inversion or fwi and then integrated depth imaging where we integrate different kind of aspect to get a very geologic earth model so as you see in time imaging or you know there are many blocks in that but here i have put the main building blocks that is necessary important and we can't move ahead without doing that 
So let's move to the first block, which will be geometry merge. As we know, once we record the data set, we have two informations. One file is the coordinate information, other file is the seismic. A seismic that is recorded has no if it is not, not given a identity, which is the XY coordinates, the datums, the spheroids, and the projections. So how can we match that? It should have a unique ID that is common to both the files to match it. Usually the time and the date stamp along with X and Y is used to match, do the matching. And that is the only concept that goes to the process of geometry merge. And other header information are often added during this process that is needed for further processing. For MARI, it is P190, which is processed SPS file, and for land, sorry, uh, which is processed uh, navigation file, and for land, it is SPS, which you know is cell format processing. And there is also P294, if I have not forgotten, which is unprocessed P190. So these are the files that are taken to merge with the seismic. Now, the seismic has got the identity. It has a reference, it has a unique value, and it is ready for processing. And this is the first basic step done within in the boat, during equation, or in the processing center. So after completing the first stage, it comes the basic sequence of doing the time processing which is D signature and statics. I would like to stress here, velocity analysis is also done in between the stages. And it is done whenever and wherever needed for time processing. Going to the D signature and statics, to start with, as we all know, when we start an equation, we put a source. And the source simply generates a spike, that's it. And that spike converts with the system and the reflectivity, and the analysis is added, which gives us the trace. When within this, we want to extract the reflectivity. This component. Let me try to bring my cursor and the laser pointer. Yeah, reflective. So, but the only thing that we impound on the system is the source signature. And hence, we can use it to do deterministic deconvolution, which is the process called designature, and try to remove it from the equation. So we are left with ET, RT, and NT, which is the random noise reflectivity and system wavelength. It's a pretty simple process, believe me. So going forward, the objective of this is signature are very common, like D-bubble is one of the process in that D signature, which is mostly used in marine, where we have the bubble effect, which we have to remove. Zero phasing is an obvious process that minimum phase is needed, where needed, based on the processing, like before decon. And important is hosting and de-hosting. This is a very important topic nowadays. So, what I have here, I have a synthetic vibrosis suite, which is a model, which is converted to give the wavelet. And this wavelet is converted with a seismic. And where you see my cursor or the pointer, this is a buried source model signature. The polarity depend, depends on the convention that we use. So, buried source signature looks like this. And this is a surface source signature, like in the case of marine. So this is an example how a source signature might look or will look. So what do we do with that? So other than the basic use of a 1D filters and all other stuff, in the current world, what we normally call in the industry term is de-hosting. In certain companies, it is called simultaneous adaptive de-hosting, which means you de-host both source and receiver side. And what's the purpose of it? To get a broad band processing. You will understand what I'm saying it when I put the example forward. 
So, but before I do that, let's leave review at the source weblet, right? Or the weblet that we have. If you see here, this is the weblet that it looks like when you have the source and receiver host. And this is the bubble part. This is what we remove when we do the debubble process. And this is the same weblet when you remove the receiver host. And this looks, this, this is the source. This is the weblet with source course. Okay. This, this is not helping. Okay. And here, what you see is the weblet with no host, no source host, no receiver host, which means this is the ideal weblet, a strong peak with no side loads. And this is what is expected. Now, let me flip between the two images which you see here. This is the data data set that has been acquired and no ghosting has been done. Let the image speak by, speak by himself. Okay. This is before adaptive deghosting and this is after. So you can pretty much see the change in resolution what we have achieved. So what happens ideally is when we remove the source and receiver ghost we expand the spectrum and once we expand the spectrum and we remove the lobes our wavelength becomes pretty sharp and focused which is a peak the polarity can be different depending on if it is inverse polarity or seg polarity whatever option we have selected but overall the bandwidth of the data set is increased this is before this is after and you can see there is a strong peak and a very mini or a residual side level, if I can say. So this is what a deghosting does, and this is called adaptive deghosting, which is a very important step nowadays in marine processing to bring the broadband of the data, and which is very much expected nowadays. It's a common procedure, it is expected. I'm not sure this is currently available in the books, are still is in the books, but this is the industry way it is done. Now, coming to the status. So, after the designature, static is a very important part also. As we all know, for land processing, statics is like must. But there is also static corrections done on marine data sets. And statics are nothing but the time shift of the traces, that's it. And that's it, there's nothing much more. So for land, we have elevation statics, we have datum, we have near surface statics and all that zest. For marine, we have source receiver statics because the source and receiver are not on the same depth. So we have to compensate that difference in travel time. It is minute, but it is still makes a difference. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are speaking to myself. No, no, sir. You are okay. audible. Yes. Sir. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, to to kind of do the statics, we need a near velocity also, which is very important. And also for a reference datum, we have to have to correct the statics based on the reference datum. Let me give you a simple example here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Can you see on the left-hand side? This is the acquisition surface, A and B. A is the source point and B is the receiver point. Let's say for example. And you see the reflectors are mirroring the surface, right? Well, try to do exploration on this data set. Oil is the distance dream. So we have to correct that variation. So on the right-hand side, it shows how we correct that. We take a reference datum and then we shift everything, the traces to make it geology and give it a meaning for the processing and the uh, exploration purpose. That's the difference of applying a statics and not applying a statics. This is a very striking image. How do we That's the question, right? Let's see. So, to do statics, we need to have a near surface model or which means a near surface velocity model or we should know the velocity information of the near surface. Well, for marine, it is pretty easy, right? Water velocity. For OBC, it is pretty easy. Water velocity. 
for transition, yeah, mud and all the stuff, velocities which you can still make a good guess. For land, God help us because it changes a lot, right? So we have to know or measure the near surface velocity. So how do we do that? Uphold service helps do that, measuring the direct arrival. Low velocity layer surveys using the refraction arrivals or from the recorded short records. As you see, I have highlighted few things and this usually means the latest new gen technologies. Here it is called refraction FWI, which means refraction full waveform inversion. And I will explain later in a little bit more detail what it is. It generates a very high resolu resolution and very accurate near surface model. The first break picking is a very old way of doing it and it is still valuable and it is still done by default by everybody. So if you take, pick the first break and you run a tomography inversion on that to get a near surface model. And other important part which is currently used and most vividly used I would say is the surface wave analysis. Here it is called SWAMI surface wave analysis, modeling, and inversion. So what is what it does is that it inverts the surface wave to get the near surface information. And you can pretty much see that with and without statics, this is, this is a very old image, I would say. And with the current processing, you will see the image much better with statics and all that stuff because the near surface velocity model will be more accurate in any environment, land, marine, or OBC. So you can see the difference, right? What it makes to the stack without or with initial statics, which we call the elevation statics or the residual statics. So that's the importance of statics and the near surface velocity model. That's very important for static calculation. Now, going to the marine part. So what statics do we apply? I said before, we apply tidal statics. We apply gun cable statics, but there is one more statics which is also common in certain places of the world, which is must to be applied, which is water velocity correction. What does it physically mean? It corrects the variation of water temperature and salinity, which means the variation that we see on a gather, from within a gather, from offset, near offset to far offset, which you see in my cursor, which I am pointing, right? This is a gather that represents the position here, and this is a gather that represents the position here. And you can easily see the water bottom is pretty jittery, right? And try to estimate a velocity model with this, it is definitely going to go in the wrong direction. But after water velocity correction, you see the water bottom is pretty much flat, and it represents uh, close enough or the true water bottom at this point. Other part, this is below is a migrated image where in the left panel you see the water bottom, water velocity correction is not applied. On the right hand side it is applied. So it will be, I would have to say good luck whoever starts modeling with the left panel because the velocity will be pretty much not going in the right direction. Hence, water velocity corrections in these cases is must and to be done. Now, I think, yes, that's all the basic stuff, all the advanced stuff that we do for statics and DC signature. Then moving to the noise attenuation. The noise attenuation flow fits in every step. You can, <coughs> you can add it before, after. You can run it as many times as you want before migration, after migration and it's a slow progression approach. You don't try to hit it in the first end. Remember, we have to preserve primary. We have to preserve the hydrocarbon indicators, sweet spot, dark spot, sorry, bright spot, flat spot. This all has to be preserved. So it's a slow approach, methodological approach, and you have to understand the noise before you start doing it. So, so what do we do specifically? In general, there are a lot of algorithms we can apply because the noise can be divided into two components, basically, and that's it, coherent and non-coherent. We have to exploit the character of the noise to eliminate it, and that is the differentiator we have to use to select the algorithm to attenuate it. 
which means, for example, we are trying to remove a random noise and there is a dipping noise crossing it. By a certain algorithm, we are removing the random noise and we are also removing part of the dipping noise. That is inaccurate approach. Why? Because we are destructing the character of the linear noise and it will be hard in future algorithms to map it and eliminate it. Okay? So, ideally the purpose of all noise attenuation is simple. Increase the signal to noise ratio. Reduce the noise, enhance the signal, which means preserve the primary. The choice of algorithms are many which are there in the test books. You can do it in tau p domain, you can do it in fx domain, you can do it in fk domain, you can do it in ht domain. There are many petty algorithms to do that job. But this is what I'm presenting is little bit advanced nowadays which is used in the industry or is accepted to be used in the industry which is the 3D adaptive noise attenuation which is mostly used for marine service. What it does is that it uses the tau p space and the multi-cable information to model the low frequency noise and then it kind of subtracts it outside using the adaptive method. So we preserve the signal, we work in a 3D mode so we kind of map the noise in a very, very, how to say, very secure way to remove it with the sense that we are preserving the primary to the best it is possible. So that's, the, here is the example of before 3D ADNA and on the right is the example of after 3D ADNA, 3D ADNA. And we can e easily see the difference that how much signal to noise ratio has been increased. This is kind of a very nice approach nowadays used robustly to remove the random noise and part of the coherent noise most of the time. Moving forward, the other is then the multi-component domain where there is a shear component. So how the shear component is recorded on the Z component? Usually it is P converted to S, S converted to P. And you can clearly see by the arrows that the shear waves are slow in velocity, so the arrival time is later also, and it has a low velocity information. So we model the shear noise and remove it from the Z component. And that's the manner which is used mostly in the multi-component or PZ processing. Other important one is SWAMI. See the SWAMI is coming again. This is a very powerful tool. So in the land, we are pretty much accustomed that ground roll is a very tough noise to remove. It can be removed in SK, but it leaves the imprint which is not suitable for advanced processing nowadays. And where we, where the exploration projects are always asked to mitigate the risk of uncertainty. So what we see here is a ground roll and the guided waves. So what we do is that we plot this in the FK domain and we map the various arrivals in a high density FK plot. And then we, these are called the dispersion curves. Then we model the dispersion curves in XT domain and then subtract it with the input. So what we do is we remove the ground roll and we also remove other orders of the S waves that has been recorded. And this is a very effective and prudent way of removing ground roll. On So, Swami is very effective in this process. Now, going to the next slide. Okay. So, here we have covered the geometry merge, the designature statics, noise attenuation, and then we will move into multiple. Multiple attenuation, as you know, is a very important step because multiple, if not attenuated appropriately, can be considered as primary and can be wrongly projected or predicted as a target zone. So it has a potential of ruining or giving a dry hole. Let's, let me put it that way. So multiple attenuation is a very robust, very intensive, and very important step in, a, in any 
kind of processing, say it land, OBC, marine, transition, does not matter. And nowadays we have the compute resources, so it's not a problem to run multiple attribution of high end and multiple attribution to remove and address the multiples. Well, I put the multiple basically as a reputation of primary. Well, that it is, right? It is has reflected many times and has been recorded, that's it. Uh, believe me, the multiple is of current interest in the industry right now because it carries the information also. And it helps in understanding certain aspects which we can't understand with the primary that is already present. So multiple is still used in certain places for exploration purposes. So as we have in the test books, a lot of multiple types of multiple kinds of multiple are there and you might have been, you might, you might be pretty much aware of it, which is water bottom peg leg multiples, free surface multiple, water bottom multiples, interbase and so on and so forth. Long period, short period, reverberations and all. But each can be differentiated based on periodicity, repeatability and veracity, which is move out, right? So these are the components that differentiate the multiples. And we have to exploit this behavior to attenuate it appropriately. Well, the conventional methods exist, FK, tau P space, deconvolution, normal radon, etc., so on and so forth, FX domain, and so on. Even the mute acts as the multiple attribution in, in a very, if you want to make a quick, quick attribution. Hello? Hello? Hello. Uh, Arjun, please uh, switch off your mic. Arjun, please switch off your mic. Uh, I'm sorry for that, sir. Arjun, please switch off your mic, sir. Uh, I, I would. Uh, uh, really, you are the host. You, uh, sir, please uh, switch him off. Uh, yes, sir. I have muted him. Uh, sir, you can continue for. Sure. Okay. I think uh, somebody can ask questions in the middle if they want to know. That way it will be more lively if anybody wants. Or else if it becomes monotonous me speaking, right? <laughs> anyway, it's up to you. I will leave that up to you. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. So, but there are, yeah, but there are other industry now, industry more, uh, algorithms that are pretty robust in multiple attribution, which I would like to put forward. So let's go to the next slide. Yes. So everybody is aware of the radon, which is differentiation of move out. But what is different in least square radar? Well, the transformation is pretty easy. You can make this algorithm work in a MATLAB or even in Excel if you can do it. The important is is transformation from XT to tau P space. How precisely it transforms from, transforms from one domain to the other, and that is very important. And least square approach kind of does the transformation in a very, the best way it is possible nowadays. So hence, least square radon is kind of the norm. There is also PDCon, where it focuses the transform to a point to the best possible way. But this is radon is all concept, but the focusing has been increased and that makes it a little bit different than the common radon that is available in very common softwares. The other important is the convolution model. So what it is, we can predict the multiple in three ways. Is predictive, or uh, which is a decon, where we know the repetitions, the other is based on move out, which is radon and all other stuff. And then is the convolutional model where you use the geometry to predict the multiples. And with the increase in computer resource and getting it cheaper nowadays, 3D predictions are pretty easy because billions and zillions of equations are solved when we do this kind of predictions, right? And with the 3D, the Better part is where we have canyons and very complex water bottom, there is not a single arrival, which means 
the reflection happens at many points before it reaches the surface, which carries the velocity information of many points at a time. So it's a complex multiple that we see. So what happens basically, if you look in this image, you have the yellow line that predicts the water bottom multiple. So what you can do is you can convert this trajectory of the source and the green are the receivers of the arrival time of this source and this receiver arrival time to predict this multiple. And that's how it keeps moving to predict the higher orders and any orders of any kind to remove it. That's how this algorithm basically works in a very short concept. So here I have in the image is a stack where you can see the multiple of a very complex water bottom. This is probably deep water because it works very well for a water bottom which is above 200 meter. So you, you can see the multiple and it is pretty much complex here. And this is the second image where we have attenuated the multiple the best we can with this algorithm. And the right is the model that has been generated from the 3D GSMP. So you can see in this complex environment how the 3D algorithm or 3D GSMP has predicted and attenuated the multiple. So 3D GSMP is generally a multiple predictor. Once we have the model, we have the input to remove the model. So it's a two-step process. Next, it is again a convolutional model, but this is applicable for shallow water or shallow environment, shallow water environment. Hello? Is it audible? Uh, yes, sir, you are audible. Okay. Okay. So this is called GDWD, which is generally deterministic water layer demultiple. It uses the similar concept of GSMP, but it works robust for the shallow water environment. And you can see how multiple has prominently removed, has been removed here. So this is an before and this is an after. Before and after, before and after. Just imagine if we wouldn't have removed this multiple where I have my pointer, one would have think, thought that's a reservoir or a zone of point of interest, but ideally it is a multiple. Can anybody guess what other process that I have presented so far has been applied here? In the very beginning in the designature step, I have explained this where the reflector looks pretty sharp and the peak is predominant. Does anybody can guess what process is there? A 3D ADD has been applied. So you see a very sharp wavelet and the broadband processing. So the peaks are pretty strong and the side lobes or the ghosts are not there. Anyway, let's proceed. Other than the surface multiples, there are other complex multiples also present, like the interbed multiples. And interbed multiples are very critical and has a very close proximity with its primary. So it sits beneath or just with the primary, and it kind of mixes with it very well. So it is very difficult to remove by radon or any other process. So the XMP kind of does the modeling using the source receiver positions and try to predict the interbreds or the arrivals as many as it can. Remember, this is a very memory intensive and costly process. So far, the algorithms that I have presented are very memory intensive, but the XIMP is two to three times more computer intensive and expensive than the previous ones, GSMP and GTWD, because it is hard to predict and it runs across zillions and zillions of equations to trying to predict the multiple. So, so this is an example, classic example of a land survey. And you can see it pretty much crosses the uh, or cuts the geology. This is before, this is after. Just imagine this multiple is present and we are trying to interpret a reservoir, for example, here. This might look as a flat spot and a potential reservoir, excuse me, if it is not removed. So this is a very important step and needed for most of the land surveys and marine surveys. 
but as I said, it is very expensive and very intensive process, but very effective. There is another flavor of that, of, uh, which is inverse scattering inter interval internal multiple prediction. And this basically what it does is does in the post act domain where it uses the horizon or without the horizon to predict the multiples. And it also predicts the diffractions and all other head waves and diving waves in total also. So it's pretty much effective in the post act domain. So in the top image, you can see the multiple that is cutting through the geologic structure. And in the bottom image, we can see we have clearly attenuated the multiples, the internal multiples that is not related to the surface, but to above bedding. So this is a very good example of ISIMP. I'm not going into detail because it has a lot of equations and algorithms which I have to present to explain it, and hope that's not the scope of this presentation. So we have done an important step. The next step is very crucial which is velocity analysis. The whole processing is that exactly depends on velocity analysis. So in all this processing, the objective is to estimate the velocity, right? These all processings are the steps in between to achieve that. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. Sir, uh, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, sir, uh, in the last uh, presentation in multiple network innovation, you have talked about all the statistical methods only, sir. I mean, uh, uh, the previous one, I mean, you just need to have uh, data with you and uh, you can just uh, do some uh, statistical calculations that you mean and uh, like SRME, we can uh, further proceed in that manner. I mean, the, all the methods that you discussed. SRME. Yeah. Yeah. SRME is just an industry name so you 3d gsmp is actually 3d srm industry wise so this is also a 3d srm which use the source receiver arrivals and the water bottom information to predict the multiples did i answer your question hello yes perfect hello yeah. So this is actually this is actually also 3D SRME. Indi industry name is 3D SRME. Surface related multiple emission. Yes. Okay. Yes. And and when you mean statistical, what do you mean when you said statistical? It uses I mean, the sir, real data uh, information. Yes, sir. I, I just need to know, sir, that uh, in, in you need to be relying on velocity models like you talked, sir. But uh, again, you have velocity uncertainties associated with velocity analysis, sir. So if there are uncertainties associated with velocity analysis, uh, of course, then in that case, sir, we won't be getting uh, the real information that, uh, yes, uh, in these cases, especially in modern cases, you won't be able to predict where are the primaries, where are the, uh, I mean, uh, multiples in that way. I mean, if you are totally relying on the velocity model. Very beautiful question. So, sir, what is your name? Sir, my name is Akash. I didn't get your name. Akash Boop, sir. Wonderful Akash. question. Very good, very good. Very wonderful question. You know, for this kind of method, we don't need the velocity. We just need the water velocity and the source and receiver information. So it is kind of not very much dependent on velocity. So your question is valid. So if we don't have a good velocity model, then multiple attribution becomes unpredictable, right? Or it can be doing the other way around. That's the reason the radon demultiple, which, which is mostly dependent on velocity, is not suggested in the initial stage. But this particular algorithm, 3D SRME, if you can say, relies on water velocity, which you might know, which you will probably know well and well enough, and the source receiver position, which you have already recorded, right? So it uses this information to do the convolutions. This is also the convolution model. In mathematical terms, this is a convolution model. So you get a very good estimate irrespective of the uh, error in velocity. Yes. That, 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 that's the reason it is very much appreciated or accepted in the industry for the multiple process. 
wonderful question and very good analysis at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Any more questions? Any more questions? Every question is good. Please feel free to ask if you have any. Presenting one of them is pretty much difficult for me also. If you don't have questions, let's proceed. You can always come back and ask me any question from behind. I can answer it. No issues. So, velocity analysis. So, ideally, what do we... Ideally, what do we record? We record only the arrival times across the offsets, right? That's the thing we record, nothing else, and the amplitude. So how do we get the velocity? So this is the basic equation which everybody is aware, every geophysicist is aware. So the objective is to get the velocity that to make the gather flat, which is shown in the second panel. And this is an example of an overcorrection and undercorrection. So the objective is to get a velocity that makes the CMP gather flat using the arrival times. That's it. And what is the physical meaning of it? To get the rock velocity. And why do we need the rock velocity? To measure the stress, strain, and other geomechanical properties that we need to do for exploration purpose. Hence, velocity is the key important part of processing. It's all about velocity, believe me. So, is same velocity used everywhere for every process? The answer is no. Probably you guys know that. For gather flattening, we need RMS velocity. We can do away with RMS velocity. And for imaging, we work with interval velocity. I would like to quickly also introduce the concept of anisotropy here. Somebody has to be the timekeeper if I'm going overboard. Anisotropy is a uh, systematic variation of any physical property depending on the direction which is measured. And for time, it is eta, which means the far offset correction. That's the reason I have this. It is also called the hockey stick effect. Uh, you can ask me question what does VTI, HTI, TTI mean, but if I guess you guys know, if not, I can explain it. Uh, interactive velocity analysis. Every industry, everybody has a similar kind that this is a tool, but the process, what is used to generate or uh, to estimate a velocity remains same. The semblance, which is a stacking power, a CMP, a MBFS panel, which is a percentage scale velocity panel to see at what velocity, at what depth or time the uh, gathers are flat. For QCs, we use isochromes to kind of map what kind of velocities we have done. And we also pick the anisotropy in a similar fashion. Well, it's a good luck if you do manual. Yes. Any questions? Uh, sir, you talked about sir, in velocity. Yes. Uh, sir. yes, sir, I have questions, sir. Sir, in velocity analysis, sir, we are basically uh, not in, I mean, we, uh, we have some limitations when we talk about lateral velocity variations. I mean, uh, still we have different kind of uh, uh, methods to tackle that, but uh, of course we must consider that we uh, uh, we are unable to actually map or take uh, into consideration the lateral velocity variations uh, in uh, when we, whenever we do seismic processing, or especially the velocity analysis. Uh, but your these methods are actually uh, what actually it does. I mean, uh, how it uh, takes into consideration this an isotropy effect actually. Can you explain it uh, again, sir? I mean, I, I could not get it. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. So what happens uh, when we when we migrate the volume, we provide two fields. One is the VPN, which is the normal move out, which is valid for near offsets. And we also provide the eta field, which is valid for far offsets. So the migration algorithm within it uses these two velocity fields to do the travel time computation. And hence, you get the correction at the far offset. And hence, you get the correction or the anisotropy included in your travel time. So these velocity fields are used in your migra within your migration algorithm to do the travel time computations. Is that your question? 
Yes, sir. Uh, some parameters were there. I mean, uh, when I was doing uh, actually an internship in that, uh, uh, actually industrial training in that, they talked about uh, some parameters like eta and psi. Actually, uh, there was, uh, that was the same when I was in third semester, actually. And I, I just wanted to know about it, actually. Uh, psi and psi, uh, delta, they talked about something like that. And they, ta uh, they taught us, actually, uh, I mean, uh, he was an expert, uh, but uh, I could not get it, sir. But, uh, I think he was also following this Schlumberger manual only. Uh, can you? I mean, uh, he talked about how we take into consideration this anisotropy effect because when the shot blasts, in that case, uh, per in its periphery, you want to be getting anything homogeneous or something like that. It becomes uh, difficult to map if you uh, you have no, uh, I mean, uh, no large uh, offset and receiver kind of configuration with you. In that case, it becomes uh, difficult to actually do velocity analysis. Talk uh, something like that. That's but, that's right. That's right. Because if you have a source and a receiver, it has to go through enough of it to be recorded as the far offset, right? Which is here. And anisotropy in this layer, VTI means it is faster in this layer. This is the axis of an anisotropy, right? And when you are, your yes, event is tilted like this, your anisotropy is like this, TTI. And when it is, when it is horizontal, the geology is horizontal, it is called HTI, right? Your anisotropy is in this direction, which means your sound wave propagates faster in this direction than in this direction, right? That's the simple definition of an anisotropy, right? Yes, sir. Anything else? Okay. Anything else? No, sir. I think the question is over. Okay. So, it's a good luck if we can do a manual picking for 12,000 or 20,000 square kilometers. So definitely we have to do it in an automatic way. So this is a tool that uses called Viva or Visual Interactive Time Domain Anisotropic Cosmic Velocity Analysis. It uses a 3D mode or inversion to do the estimation of uh, both VPN and VPX, which is the eta. Conversion of uh, eta is called VPX also. Or the other name is horizontal velocity. I will come to that diagram actually later. I have it. So, this is the velocity analysis, and next is the time migration. So, for time, it is pretty simple. There is only one, which is industry industry wise used, which is kickoff. The purpose is focusing and positioning and collapse of diffraction. That's it. The only difference is nowadays the algorithms can be made robust, so the tuning waves or turning waves can be in included to image complex structures and before it was not possible. But you can do a other kind of migration, start migration, FK migration, but they are old fashioned. Nobody even, the new generation might not even know how to do it or might not do it also. So this concludes the time imaging. Now comes the interesting part, the most interesting part. So time imaging is a very important part because this prepares the data set for your higher level of uh, imaging process, right? And you have to use that seismic to do your velocity modeling, which is the main objective of processing. So, we jump to time imaging. Uh, we need to have the anisotropy estimation. As I explained before, that there are three kinds of anisotropy. Well, there is four, orthorhombic also, which I'm not talking here because that's a different dimension totally. So, we have epsilon, delta, and uh, uh, epsilon delta, what I'm saying, epsilon delta deep azimuth and eta. So for depth imaging, we use epsilon and delta. For time imaging, we use eta. So VTI uses, uses the VPN, epsilon, and delta. The TTI uses VPN, epsilon, delta, azimuth, and deep. Which, which is obvious, right? You need to have to give the azimuth and D for your epsilon and delta to find the direction. And HTI also uses the same information. And this, this is critical to give. Hello? And most, most important is this diagram. Yes. Sir, I think there is a question. Yes. Hello? Uh, Sir, yes. what is epsilon yes. and delta? Epsilon and delta are the directions of, uh, so delta represents the time shift and epsilon represents the far offset corrections. 
in depth imaging so when you do delta for event that was in one second for example if you just apply delta it will go up so there is a vertical shift and with epsilon it does the far offset correction same like the type did i answer your question yes sir okay that that was a very good question actually is uh, very smart very smart so these are very important very important delta and epsilon and does anybody know which is bigger the delta or epsilon then the delta in general is always less than epsilon that's standard okay so these are the and why we give the azimuth and dip to give which direction it has to do the correction and isotropic migration is no more done because it has no meaning right because nowadays uh, not not nowadays we have uh, compute to do it and in the old days compute was the limitation not the concept because arc is not isotropic so how do we estimate anisotropic parameters that's the most difficult part i would say in the depth processing so we use well markers this gives the delta estimation more mostly check shot mostly delta estimation anisotropic scanning this gives delta and epsilon both bsp delta core analysis also gives the speed and if you don't have anything of all this above don't worry we will use the uh, geologic informations or the legacy informations book informations or near similar geology informations to have some function to start with because now we have the capability to do multi parameter update which means we can simultaneously update vpn epsilon and delta so this is the advantage we have but something is better than nothing in this case the questions on this it's actually itself is a big topic for discussion for 2 3 days means it has lot of it it is very difficult to put it in one slide but still any question Uh, yes, uh, we can hear. Yes. You. Okay. So, uh, uh, question uh, question is not clear. Can you please write it? But yeah. Uh, sir, why uh, we are not using isotopic migration? Only computer, only computer disadvantage is there. That's why. Uh, we were using isotropic, and now we are using anisotropic migration. Any more? That's right. Content? Because now we have end up from. Well, I, well, in in general, you know, Earth is not isotropic, right? It is not the scenario. Earth is anisotropic, but in previous times, compute was not uh, powerful enough and not cheap enough and not strong enough to go ahead with this uh, high end. anisotropic migration but nowadays compute power is not at all an issue okay so yeah. so so now we have to go to the velocity model once we have the anisotropic estimation and this depth flow is all about velocity model and this is the important step industry wise everybody does it everybody similar step different algorithms might be but follow the almost same. we start with the velocity model we run a migration we check the gather if it is fat we pick the sips sips are nothing but all residuals which means you pick the events and make sure if they are flat you can't go and check if you say it is flat or not you run some residual move out analysis and make sure if most of the things are flat if it is not flat you go to picking you do run the linear tomography equations which is where i do the equation building and solving then you up the, out the output of a tomography is the updated model and then again we run this cycle we follow this cycle as long as possible 
it can be any number of iterations unless we get a satisfactory rmo which means that rmo has to less be less and when it is yes we do the imaging or we take that model for imaging and this is very important step so people call iterations 20 10 5 you name it they keep running it. but there has to be a guideline right we can't just keep running iterations blind so we have to start with something actually we start with a longer scale lens we solve the long wavelength velocity variations and then we proceed down to short scale lens and then at the end we get a high resolution model and that's the object and we have to avoid cycle skipping so we can't jump from here to here you might see cycle skipping. so it's the slow progressive process hence the iteration once we have the model but as i said near surface model is also important in land because we shoot rays from surface where the source and receiver lies so there are algorithms to predict very high resolution near surface models the one i am presenting is a diving wave tomography this is very robust model and works only for shallow up to 100 200 meter because it uses the diving waves or the refractions to build the or predict the model and this goes and then adds up to the next sequences which i have presented in the previous step the loop so this is an example on the left is a peak stack time migration converted to depth without diving wave where the near surface was not was not good on the right with the same psd it the diving wave model in the near surface the sip common image point tomography is the tomographic equation which is the equation solver it solves all the resilience of ray paths to give you a velocity model and it can be anisotropic of any kind vti hti tti or thermal you can give as many as you want it want and it can be multi parameter which means it can update simultaneously vpn fl the beauty once we have the model what the use of it you have to run the migration and here the whole thing is it's all about migration and the image because at the end we need this right so on in this axis you see the increase in lateral velocity complexity and this axis is increasing structural complexity and you see the algorithms presented how complex it can handle and the reverse time migration is the king of all migration because it is can handle lateral and increase structural complexity of any kind without reservation i'll present few examples to understand this so kirkhoff again is the basic one that everybody has and uses and you can see the difference between kirkhoff psdm and kirkhoff psdm the difference is obvious this is must be a vti and this must must be a vti higher but the kick off depth can handle higher lateral variations and turning waves better than the time time one the other one is gaussian packet migration as i said the industry the advanced ones i have highlighted or made it bold GPM or Gaussian packet migration is a quick migration to give a very stable image of the steep dipping area. This is mostly used for imaging and quick turnaround to have a better quick look on the images. And the next one is the adaptive beam. It is a full full fledged migration where we image the high dips in a very high resolution. It is much much better than Kirchhoff. And and you can see the example. This is a Kirchhoff. and this is a abm output of the same velocity model and on the country we have the rtm which is reverse time migration where it is can handle any kind of complex velocity complex geology and rtm can nowadays fit out vector partition or vector image partition gather such sub surface offset gather and sub surface angle azimuth gather these are different forms of gather uh, it is a part of discussion which i am didn't put it here because it will take long to explain 
but it is VTI and TTI capable and it gives very robust image of you can see that geological complexity of salt and you can see the image it is how crystal clear the image is RTM nowadays is very cheap it will astound, astound you people everybody almost does RTM because because the compute capability RTM is like basic kind of done mostly in last six years I have now I've seen everybody going for RTM without reservation it is costly but it is it's doable years ago RTM was like the king and people used to only use RTM because it used to long, run longer and it was a very costly and memory intensive process and that ends the depth imaging and now we have to go to the advanced depth imaging which is FWI and integrated modeling any questions in depth imaging okay Sir, uh, I have some questions. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Uh, excuse yeah. me, sir. Uh, sir, yeah. uh, can you uh, briefly explain about the tomography portion? I mean, uh, that uh, auto peak residual move out you talked about, sir. I mean, auto peaking you talked about, sir. In that, sir, uh, I, I have one question that uh, it is uh, RNN based, uh, I mean, uh, Uh, it is based on picking the residual move outs of the events in the gather, which in short term means, let me draw it. Let me try to draw it. Which means if you have a gather that represents like this, it tries to, it tries to pick the event and it uses that information. So it has to be flat, right? So this is the residual move out. So it tries to use this information, this peak information, to give a solution that will flatten it, so, or give a velocity model that will flatten the gather. Did I make sense? Okay, sir. Uh, okay. VSP can give me the velocity model, I mean, uh, that we need for this uh, inversion. Yes, it will give the velocity model that we need for inversion. After this loop, the output is a velocity model. So this is your output after every update. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. 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 Moving to the full waveform inversion. So full waveform inversion is the current trend. And this gives a very high fidelity model, very reliable model. And it, the engine of FWI and RTM is almost the same. It's forward modeling, OK? And it uses a two-wave equation to solve the high resolution velocity. And it is anisotropic fully. So what it does, I will say in short, it does the forward modeling and it matches with the current uh, shot or the image or the technique and finds the residual and then it goes to an iterative loop to reduce that residual and that's the velocity it gives okay that's in short this full waveform inversion is a book in itself but i gave you the gist it is the model the predict model versus the uh, observed which is the recorded difference and the reduced minimization of that difference is the modeling part okay so here i have an example of a legacy tomography model and this is with fwi updated model and you can see how thin layers are kind of modeled velocity model has come up propped out so nicely it can be reflection fwi refraction fwi or diving wave fwi it means all kind of information in together or separate we can do it And one important thing, if somebody has noticed, because of the elastic model is very expensive nowadays, even nowadays, we mostly do acoustic modeling. We can do elastic modeling, but it takes a lot of days and enough resources, and it is very costly, very costly. Even current compute capabilities are not sufficient enough to run a full-blown project. It happens, but 
it depends. It's very, very expensive. Okay, let me present you a few more flavors of it so you get what's happening in the globe nowadays. So, adjustive FWI is mostly uh, the diving wave or refraction FWI. And here I'm not going in detail, it uses a similar engine <coughs> and does a similar uh, work, only it restricts to <coughs> certain waveforms. Yes. Excuse me. So, this is a Tomo model. And this is after full waveform inversion. You, you can see the resolution of the image. It's way above. This kind of velocity model is very important for exploration purpose. And the depth slice is at this point. And other one is the reflect, reflection full waveform inversion, which is uses the reflection because in the shallow you can use the diving wave or the reflection and reflections to make the model. But shallow is a, but deep down, you have to rely on the reflections, right? Because the offset limitation is there. We can hardly record up to, or we hardly record up to 10 and 20 kilometer. With nodes, we can record 40 effectively, but there is a limitation, right? And this is the beauty of reflection FWI. It brings the geology down, down deep to a very nicer extent. The modeling is very, very, uh, robust and more closer to the real geology. In this whole study, the well, the well is also used to validate this model and used in the preparation of the models, I must say. So I kept it short and sweet, full, full waveform inversion, but you kind of got the gist that what happens in the full waveform inversion, and this is the current uh, trend of modeling. And it is used in integration with the tomography together or independently. I will present that in the integrated velocity modeling slide. So let's move to the integrated modeling. Here I'm presenting an example where I mentioned the SIP tomography and FWI is used in conjunction. Yes. Is used in conjunction to give a very high fidelity velocity model. This is a velocity model from tomography, and this is a velocity model which has been using the FWI and SIP tomography to complement each other. And you can really see the difference, right? Using this kind of approach, these are the current industry norm of doing the velocity model building, and this is very much common used in most projects nowadays in any company. I can say in almost all companies. Other example is using, this, it is called simultaneous, simultaneous joint inversion where we use the FWI, the SIP peak, and the non, and the geophysical data sets other than seismic like gravity and magnetotelic information. So we use all those information and invert it jointly and then make our velocity model. You can see example here. This is the workflow, but it varies, depends on the geology. So this is one example of workflow that has been, I have picked it. We can use in conjunction in many ways or any ways we want within the project, anywhere we need. And it depends on the geology and the objective we are trying to achieve. But this potential fields are very important nowadays. And you can see the example on the previous image and the below image with SGI and without SGI. We made a big difference in this image. And similar here, this is without SGI and with SGI. So using additional information, de-risk the model building exercises and also de-risk the exploration, exploration uh, aspect also. The third example is a very complicated way, which is nowadays very popular Everybody wants to de-risk their uh, exploration field because nobody wants to want to have a dry hole, right? Yes. Excuse me, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I have a question, sir. Sir, uh, sure. you talk, I mean, uh, sir, uh, how we can, uh, I mean, uh, we need to be taking into consideration the wind data also. Uh, I mean, these kind of inverts, they can... Take care of your low preparation. I talked about these things. Or we need to be able to. I mean, that it is band limited. I can't get the information below 10 years and uh, not get information above 8 years. 
So in that case, uh, these kind of inversions. Uh, so how you develop uh, the low velocity model, the traditional ones that we use generally in uh, our inversion. I mean, uh, like three step, four step, this kind. Of how is different from that? I just want to know. Uh, I didn't get your full question because your voice was breaking. But let me try to put the question though as much as I understood. You are asking that the, geo the non geophysical measurements are not high resolution. How do we use those in our modeling? Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay. So the so it, it, it complements, right? I, I said it used in conjunction. So what happens is that when we have these measurements, we use you in, we invert it and use it in our modeling exercise. So whatever information we have acquired through the low frequency modeling of this gravity and magnetic data set, we put it in our inversion model. As I mentioned before, we solve the long wavelength and then the short wavelength. So the long wavelength informations are also important, right, to solve first. And it definitely helps in those scenarios. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir, but the basements will be different. I mean, uh, the depth that you are going to get will be different. The depth that we Absolutely are Absolutely right. Very, very good. Very good. <laughs> That's a very good point. Very good point. I'm really impressed. Yes. This is what... See, we, with this non-geophysical measurements, we don't rely fully on that. We try to use that information. It gives some information, right? Like the multiple I said. Multiple is also gives some information. So this gravity and magnetic does give some information or indications. We use those indications in many ways and any ways, like interpretation, fitting the interpretation to converge or merge to that point. The depth might not be accurate. But there are other tools that are in conjunction working with it to give the accurate depth. But at least we know that there is a basement, there is a catasheus, there is a salt which we have to measure and map with our velocity model. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Very good question. Okay, and, and this answers your question actually in example three. Here, we use every measurement that is possible. We use the well information, we use FWI, we use SIP tomography, we use gravity magnetic, we use the rock physics, we use petrophysics, we use petroleum model, we use well logs, we use structural interpretation, you name it, we use it to guide our velocity model implicitly or explicitly. And lot of projects nowadays are happening in this guideline because this reduces the risk, right? Well, if you have a well, this kind of approaches are very easy, but certain areas does not have wells. They are virgin areas or very old wells are there, 60 years old, 80 years old, which measurements are not too realistic or not recorded properly. Old days, we can expect that. But if we have those informations, we can definitely implement it to build our integrated art model with using this information explicitly or implicitly, wherever required. So this is another example, a couple of projects we do it, and I've done it, where we have used all this information together to make a model. And that has been a very wonderful project. And but this requires a good team of exploration team where we have a lot of knowledge base coming in in different forms to feed into the model building exercise. Well, this concludes the presentation. I would conclude with a very few notes which one has to be pretty much aware nowadays. Processing has evolved, hence the compute power has evolved. It's no more, we don't depend much on DECON. DECON is still a process, but we have more other tools to predict the multiples, imaging, and everything in a better way. Machine learning, artificial intelligence is paving the way for future imaging strategies. Forward modeling is getting cheaper because of compute power, hence next generation modeling will be much better and more complex. We might be able to do uh, uh, elastic modeling in next couple of years when the compute can, can become much more robust, right? And cloud processing is becoming the new, is the new norm or is going to be the 
next new norm in couple of months or in years. We are, we are processing in cloud, and most of the companies are doing it. With that, I open the floor for more questions. Please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, sir, I have uh, I am... Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Hello? Yes, you are audible. Please uh, uh, ask your question. Sir, uh, I have a question that when last time we went for industrial team, they were using Omega software, sir. In that, we were having a lot of QCs. I mean, uh, to each state, yeah. you have a QC quality control associated with it. Uh, some uh, steps that you talked about, let it be full wave inversion or any other method like tomography. So, what are the QCs associated with that? I mean, we have some idea about velocity analysis, time hydration, noise attenuation, of course. Uh, so, but uh, the new methods that you discuss right now, what will be the quality controls associated with it? Likewise, in velocity analysis, they were doing multiple time of channeling, uh, I mean, passing uh, again and again uh, the same data. Uh, but to yeah. these new uh, concepts that you talked about, so what will be the quality controls associated? Can you please uh, uh, describe it in brief? Sure, sure. That, uh, the quality controls are important and done at every step, as we have seen. So the basic quality controls are RMOQCs, which is from gathers. The other quality controls are interpretation, where the interpretation team interprets and maps with the geology. These are also done. The other quality controls are in the FWI, we also match the... So once we have the final model, we say this is a final model, so what we do, we again use that velocity to do the forward modeling and match it with the observed or the acquired shot, right? And when the residual is zero, we know we have converged. And that convergence becomes the QC. So there are a lot of QCs based on this to understand if we have converged. The RMO is done for depth modeling. The similar kind of RMO is done in FWI. But the most reliable one which we rely is on the well information. So if our, we have well and our image is matching or the well mistides are reduced, then we kind of pretty much uh, believe that we have converted. We also do the use the VSP information to run the mistides, right? So that are the QCs we do all the way. And in, in this general process, the stacks, images, and gathers are run at every stage. Because nowadays migration are cheap. So Nobody holds on to fund migration. We want to QC something, we migrate the whole circle. So, uh, sir, one more question, sir. Uh, you talked about decumulation. I mean, you just said it, but uh, just I have one question, sir. Accordingly, I mean, if not this uh, technical, it might sound. Sir, in migration, uh, at book, uh, you will be reading some books saying that uh, simply it is written that the migration compresses your basic wavelength and that's why it increases your resolution, temporal resolution, I agree. But uh, how it does so? I mean, I could not get it. How it does so? so just by compressing the wavelength, uh, how it happens? I mean, what is the idea behind it? So, I, I can't say, my, I won't say the migration compresses the wavelength. But no, 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 so spiking decan, what it does, it takes the uh, timing that you give. You give four millisecond or two millisecond, right? Whatever is your sampling you want to spike to. So it takes that and compresses the wavelength and try to squeeze it within that, within that timing period that you have given. Uh, I just want to know that is it uh, related with the envelope? I mean, uh, you have an envelope with you and uh, uh, in. Uh, in uh, I mean, when you compress the wavelength, what uh, actually it means? I mean, you are uh, confining the energy uh, in a very short uh, interval, 
So that's why it increases the resolution or something like that. Likewise, we have frenal zones in migration where you uh, decrease the radius of your right frenal migration and then increase the resolution, uh, like for in case of migration. Similar thing happens in this case also is, uh, is there some difference between uh, that one and this one? Yes, yes. No, it actually increases the broadband. So it you are basically... Yeah, it's a poor man way of increasing the broadband. But we don't have to do that in marine because we have adaptive deghosting process. But for land, we have also other uh, process where we can increase the bandwidth of the data set. So we don't have to do spiking decon is is done. I won't say it is not done, but we have other better ways to achieve the same. So what are the methods you can use for that, sir? Can you discuss it? I mean, uh, just in brief, uh, at least in the names of those methods. Uh, likewise, you talked about two methods uh, right now. So uh, there is a model-based ba wavelet processing where we do it statistically, and we can also uh, do it by 1D operator. So it's pretty basic. There's nothing much you can do, right? In the broadband expansion, you have to expand the spectrum, that's it. So you have to uh, involve it with a wavelet that uh, that defines the gap between what you expect and what you have. So you can achieve in these two ways. Okay. okay. Any more questions? No, sir, I think... Uh, Any questions in the... Um, uh, no, sir, I think... Everybody has followed. Uh, they, yeah. <laughs> they, they have followed the whole lecture and uh, there is no question here. And meanwhile, we have a okay. uh, few questions from Akash Deep and uh, others. So sure. Uh, however, so if anybody has a... Yes, sir. If you have questions online, you can read it. Hey, yes, sir. I think we don't have any questions uh, uh, right now. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, I mean, uh, there were, uh, uh, what kind of sure. work uh, actually uh, you do at Slumberj? So, a few of the participants actually asked that uh, <laughs> before, sure. uh, before sure. your sure. session. Yes, sir. Sure. So, I am in the, currently I am in the role of which means, we advise people how to build a workflow on a serial on a particular geologic settings of any type of survey. It can be any kind, land, marine, OBC, PZ, whatever you can say. And I have shown you a few of the work that we do on the integrated flows. So we design these integrated flows and try to explain different ways how to do it. So we do this kind of jobs. And also I'm the client interface where I try to address their concerns and questions. Similar to the one you guys are asking, client also asks a lot of questions. And somebody has to be responsible, so I kind of act as a trusted advisor. Or similar colleagues like me who are there, they act as a trusted advisor. So that's the role we play. At this point, uh, much of testing I'm not doing because I'm building up, uh, we also have to mentor people to do the testings. We have done our part when we were in the position of geophysics, but we still do if needed, wherever needed, and guide them by action sometimes. Other than that, we create uh, best practices and sometimes test new technologies or new flows or new concepts and give presentations. A lot of people, because not, always, not everyone is a processing geophysicist, right? Like I'm not a geomechanist guys, so I also have to learn geomechanics. So, so we kind of exchange these presentations to learn more. 
So this is my role basically, okay. and that's how we do it. So, but I have started as a processor where I did everything by hand, and then I moved up the ladder. <laughs> and did that answer? <laughs> or you have more, yes, you sir. can ask as many questions as you want. <laughs> I know curiosities are there, so it's good. <laughs> uh, sir, sir, there is a question. Uh, what about, uh, sir, uh, what about the, some of the traditional sequences like you have DMO and these all things uh, related to the processing sequences, some of the sequences like you have DMO, statics. Sometimes they say that uh, it can be taken care with the migration and uh, sometimes they say that it is not done in the marine case like a static correction. Uh, sir, in number three, how you uh, uh, take all these things. I mean, uh, I know that in Omega they were doing a lot of things that were ahead of their time. I mean, not in the traditional way, I'm giving them uh, the best uh, kind of picture. So, sir, uh, what are the traditional but steps that we in our books uh, is not more valid in your uh, processing sequence? Actually. No, no, it is valid. It is valid. It is valid. But remember, DMO is the old process where we where the norm move out exception was the move out application was very much limited right on a deep dipping areas but nowadays we are doing anisotropic so dmo is no more a needed term kind of thing but still it is done for example if you want a fast track product you have three days to process the whole test me what will you do you run a dmo and then you migrate it it is still done so it's not a redundant process but Things have evolved, and we can do things in a much better way and a quicker way, kind of thing. So, what we read in the test books are the basic. That's the reason in this presentation I didn't put the basic things that are in the test books. I tried to put the stuff that is the industry norm, so that you guys are abbreviated with these terms well before you are joining in any other kind of industry, oil industry, right? So, if somebody says SRM, you kind of are aware of the terms. If somebody says FWI, you are aware of that term. Because test books, usually, I don't know how it has changed or evolved uh, over 10, 15 years, uh, but these are the new terms that are used in the industry. Uh, sir, uh, one more question, sir. In uh, generally, in, in, uh, I mean, whenever we do reservoir characterization, we are basically all the equations that we have today is basically for classic carbonate kind of formation, sir. So, in case of unconventional reservoirs or non-classic carbonate kind of uh, non-classic non-carbonate reservoirs, how Schlumberger uh, deals with these kind of situation? I mean, especially for the characterization, we have video analysis and size conversion for it. Uh, but uh, it is mainly the equations that we need is valid for classic carbonate kind of system. Uh, and uh, but we nowadays are dealing with unconventional. We are dealing with non-classic and non-carbonate kind of formations also. So how you deal with such complexities actually? So as we have seen in the presentations, what algorithms I have presented mostly deals with complex geologies of any kind, right? Like in Brazil where you have salt, thick salt, in Gulf of Mexico, you have com complex alexanus, acetanus salt with carbonate and all the stuff, right? So it's not a problem with current algorithms we deal with. It's, uh, we can deal with any kind of reservoir on this earth and Mars also. So our softwares are sometimes also used in NASA also for processing. So, so I can say we can deal any kind of any kind of uh, geologic setting. Okay. Sir, there is a question from uh, Vasu Singh. Uh, sir, sure. am I audible? Yes, you are loud and clear. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, role of AVO in processing? That, that's a very important, nice question. So we do all this processing for AVO, right? You have you have more to that? Go ahead, go ahead. You have more to that question? Uh, no, 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 sir. Uh, no, sir, the question that's is the just question? role of AVO in processing. Okay. So, all this work is to preserve the two attributes of the amplitude acquired along the way, right? So we do the, all the processing are AVO friendly, or else there is no purpose of doing the processing. If we destroy the signature of the hydrocarbons, 
then there's no 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 need of any of these algorithms or processing that I have shown you. So we we do every possible QCs and to add to that we also do this ABO QCs to make sure the hydrocarbon indicators are not destroyed. That is also part of the QCs. Good question. Yeah. Okay, so I think what all are QCs are now, what all QCs you all perform, sir? I mean, to, uh, apart from uh, preserving amplitude kind uh, amplitude, sir. Uh, so, what all QCs uh, you all uh, take care for ABO analysis? Can you just uh, talk in brief, just the terms? I mean, okay. so for ABO analysis, we do the amplitude analysis also along the offset, and we run the ABO attributes to do it. Which is pretty simple, right? So, run the ABO analysis. That's it. And uh, with the ABO analysis. You know if you have destroyed after every process. If you run every every analysis and you know if you are destroying your uh, reservoir character, character, uh, characteristics or indicators in any process, so that QCC is pretty simple. You run the review process. Uh, so there is uh, another question. Uh, can you tell us something sure, about uh, seismic attributes? Uh, there are many kind of seismic seismic attributes. So the most common is is the RMS attributes sir, that sir, we extract, right? Uh, so sir, so uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, the question is uh, like uh, how they are used in industry. That's an addition to that question. Okay, perfect. Yes, <laughs> so all these processing are done to extract the attributes, right? So we make impedance volumes, we make gradient volumes, and all that stuff. And these are the attributes we use, which which we extract from the pre-stack or post-stack domain, right? And those attributes are used in various forms to identify the hydrocarbon uh, areas or interests, right? So all attributes, you just name it. So for example, variance is used for uh, variance and covariance is used for end tracking purpose, which is for fault estimation, right? That kind of attribute is used for this. Uh, gradient and impedance is used for AVO products, right? And RMS amplitudes are used for gross QCs. And wave envelope is used to understand if we have destroyed any character of any impedance layer. So this kind of QCs are done, and they are used explicitly. So what happens, all these attributes go into the geo model to come out with a 3D model of the subsurface. That's the whole purpose of it. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, I sir, uh, uh, sir, sir, uh, I have questions for one second. Sir, what about the multi-component surveys that we have right now, sir? Apart from the acoustic surveys, we have multi-component surveys taking place nowadays. So their processing might be different, uh, or uh, is it uh, something that we need to have in addition with our acoustic uh, processing? Likewise, we have in uh, all the processing sequences. Yes. How should I mean, the multiple components, so you have a lot of data, uh, and apart from that, you have a lot of data in gathering all the data also. So how is Schlumberger takes care of that? Multi-component processing is a, is a, it has a lot of data sets, you're right. It contains the P component, the hydrophone, the geophone Z component, the X component, the Y component, the shear wave component, right, of this. So you can have a lot of components to process. It's not a problem with the compute resource. We have algorithms to do PS migrations. So it's not at all a problem to handle this kind of touch sets because nowadays we produce, if you know the node processing is kind of the current uh, trade, right? Everybody is going for node processing. You might be pretty much aware of that. And that is multi-component data set mostly. So it's not a problem. I can say it. it's kind of easily done. Yes, we have to handle the data set, the S data sets in a different way to match it with the PSP data set and then some uh, to make a meaning of that. That process is done. So there are additional steps to that. You're right. You're very right. There are additional steps to that, but general steps which I have presented mostly apply to that. You have to do no other commission. You have to do the multiple. You have to do the signature. You have to do velocity analysis. Of course, S-wave velocity 
in a condensed in this other uh, there is some collaborative approach that it has to be taken uh, care of to get uh, to optimal point where you can say that yes so there is something in the surface and you all work in a collaborative environment for, for, uh, uh, for this purpose for the, I mean especially for for the or is there something that uh, a geophysicist can alone can do no, we have a team for that. So that's for the processing involves uh, collaboration of uh, exploration kind of capabilities also. So we have we have the team for that, expertise and team for that. Okay, sir. So uh, I think we will take the last question from Vasu Singh, and uh, that question will be. Uh, okay. What is the appropriate dominant period of seismic wave around which you look around in industry and how can we pick it to get a better result? Okay, if I understand that question, let me try to repeat it. What is the dominant frequency we look into, right? Uh, yes, sir. That's the question? Yes, sir. So, for, okay. for the so industry, it, I It think. depends on the equation. Yes. So there is no basic norm because the the dominant frequency depends on the type of equation, right? If you acquire a broadband data set, your dominant frequency will be different than if you acquire a normal low bandwidth data set. So the dominant depends on the spectrum that we have acquired. So there is, I don't know if I can say there is a norm for that, but it depends on what kind of, kind of survey, survey you have acquired. Uh, okay, sir. So uh, we don't have uh, any uh, more questions. Uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for the uh, sir, uh, very uh, informative lecture. And uh, uh, we, uh, we, we don't uh, get this kind of knowledge in our university uh, classes. <laughs> so thank you very much, sir, for <laughs> uh, for being here. Uh, uh. Excuse I would I would suggest just one thing. Uh, yes. Please go ahead to the uh, SLB site, and lot of the papers are there. Or don't worry about paper. Lot of brochures are there that kind of explain the industry co uh, algorithm that we use. Somebody is anyway leading in that, so you will have the all of it mostly. You won't miss anything, right? Mm -hmm. So go to the site. Go to the seismic imaging portal and slb.com, go to that, go to the seismic imaging portal and select all the manuals. There is short note and images to make you understand. There is no paper. It's one page always. So you can get all the information in stages of what's happening in the processing industry. Not even in processing, whatever happening in the inversion industry, what is happening in the geomechanic in industry. Because we have this all in the capabilities, right, within us. So if you, in a petrophysical world, what is happening, you can exactly get what happened. These are small, small brochures, one-page brochures you will find. Technical, not a self-brochure, but technical brochures to quickly grasp a particular uh, algorithm that is the current uh, heat kind of thing. Okay, so sure, uh, sure, sir. Uh, I think uh, somebody has to ask a question. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. sir uh, few participants are uh, asking for the slide. So, can you provide? Uh, once again, I didn't get your voice was breaking. Uh, sir, uh, the sir, few participants are asking for your slide. Sir, the presentation. Uh, uh, the you part want to get my slide? Yes, sir. So, few participants wanted that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I can send it, no issues. Okay. I can send it, no issues. Okay. Uh, I have used most of the material from the site I have said, so it is pretty much uh, public domain knowledge. And say, uh, sir, the uh, video... So I uh, can send it. Okay, okay sir. Sir, the video uh, is recording, so uh, can we uh, just simply upload the whole recording or we have to cut something or uh, make some changes? So you can tell that later uh, via email no, or you can, you can load the whole recording if you can load, load a two hour 
Szeresen érkezik. Viszont most tulajdonképpen szól, ja. Oké, oké. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, for thank this. Thank you. Yeah.